okay? Let me put this on, this technology. Well, you gotta be a little patient here. Okay, all right, so we're here. <clears throat> Today is November 28, 2021. It's gonna be like last month, next month of uh, this year, 2021. And uh, we signed the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, mm-hmm. verses 23 to 29. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here one more time, to scrutinize and to study your word. Give us your godly wisdom, dear Lord, so we can learn what's in your word. And give us the strength to share what we do learn with people that do not know the gospel. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start. It's going to be a few verses. Short. I will see. Uh, verse 23. <clears throat> it says, this is the, uh, the, the chapter of faith. So it's going to be based on faith. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. Because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded his grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Okay. So let's start with verse 23. Joe, can you read verse 23, please? 23. Verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. Because they hmm. saw he was no ordinary child, and that they were not afraid oh. of the king's edict. Okay, if you remember uh, back in the book of uh, Genesis, um, Jacob had 12 sons, and the one of the sons was uh, Joseph. And Joseph was uh, Jacob's the, you know, father's favorite. So he would give Joseph a lot of favoritism, which made him uh, very uh, unpopular with the rest of the brothers. So finally the brothers took, to, took revenge and uh, sold them to the Egyptians. I mean, to uh, some uh, nomads who were passing by. Eventually he ended up in Egypt, Joseph. And then he was in prison and he was uh, put in prison for the wrong reason, but eventually he, uh, he was released and uh, became the second most powerful person in Egypt. And the, um, and the Egyptians were there in Egypt for 400 years, and they started on the good foot, but then eventually the Egyptians treated them like uh, second-class citizens, more or less like slaves. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Hebrews became very, very numerous. So the Pharaoh of Egypt told the, uh, uh, the people that attended the, uh, uh, Hebrew women that were going to, you know, to give uh, birth, to kill all the, uh, all the baby boys because they were too numerous. But uh, of course, that was uh, crazy because <clears throat> all the little boys, Hebrew boys, were being killed, and the girls were allowed to live. So one of these boys was Moses, and Moses was uh, saved from, uh, from all this, and uh, they put it in, the, in a little basket, and eventually the basket was found by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And the daughter adopted him as her son. So that was uh, a crazy eternal events. But of course, everything was controlled by God. So let's see what, uh, <clears throat> what the text says. It says, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. It is not surprising that the faith of Moses is giving more extensive treatment than that of Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph. The Exodus held a prominent place for every devout Jew in demonstrating God's action on behalf of his people. And Moses was consequently held in the highest esteem. Our writer <coughs> of the Hebrews sees two aspects of his faith, personal and national. 
And he said that because Moses was an ordinary child. The fact that Moses was an ordinary child is also mentioned in Acts 7.20, in Stephen, Stephen's speech, and is derived directly from Exodus 2.2. 2. There was clearly something striking about the appearance of Moses to create such an impression on Pharaoh's daughter. <clears throat> and then he says, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You know, if, when they put the little boy in the, in the, in the basket, they were defying the kings. There was the face of Moses' parents. The story of their action is told in Exodus, and tells how the king of Egypt, in his hatred, tried to wipe out the children of the Israelites by having them killed at birth. That Moses was born at all was an act of faith. That he was persevered was another. He began by being the child of faith. So it was a miracle. It was a miracle, Rhea, that the boy was put in the Nile, and his sister was watching the, the thing. And uh, Pharaoh's daughter was watching with uh, her attendants, and she sees this little basket, and it was a Hebrew boy, so she decided to adopt him. And then the uh, Miriam, which was the sister of Moses, said, would you like me to get a Hebrew woman to nurse him? And uh, he said, yes. So she got her own mother, his own mother, to nurse him. So that was uh, something else. Okay, so let's go to verse 24. Uh, Nico? Okay, so Moses grows up in the palace. He gets the education of all the uh, top Egyptians. He became very popular. He became a great general. You know, how do we know this? Not from the Bible. We know from other books, like a book of Josephus. And then he, uh, <clears throat> he became very popular, and uh, probably he was going to be the second in line to be the pharaoh. Okay, but he never forgot his roots. He knew where he came from. Okay, and at the end, he really rejected that uh, upbringing to cast his lot with the Hebrew people. So let's see what the text says. It says here, the second act of faith was Moses' loyalty to his own people. The story is told in Exodus 2, 11 to 14. When Moses was entrusted to the waters of the Nile, he was found the daughter of Pharaoh. So Moses was spared. He was brought up in all luxury. He was the heir to the kingdom. He became one of the greatest of all Egyptian generals. In particular, he conquered the Ethiopians when they were threatened in Egypt, and in the end, was married to an Ethiopian princess. But all the time, he had never forgotten his fellow countrymen. And the day came when he decided to ally himself with the downtrodden Israelites and say goodbye to the future of riches and royalty that he might have had. So it was by faith that Moses, when he grew to manhood, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer evil with the people of God than to enjoy the transit pleasures of sin. For he considered a life of reproach for the sake of the Messiah was greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he kept his eye fixed upon his reward. Yeah, the Bible says so many times that uh, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes, uh, don't turn to the left or to the right. You know, just keep on going. You know, keep it straight. And sometimes you get so discouraged with so many people, you know. But also, God gives you an opportunity. For example, when I was going, since giving, I, was, I, was, I had to go with my daughter's boyfriend and his family, which I never met. So that gave me an opportunity. And all this preparation that we have, you know, and sometimes we never have an opportunity to share the word. <laughs> but the opportunity presents themselves, even though, but at the same time, you're not going to preach and give him, hit him on the head with the Bible. Just go and enjoy it. God has created all it's good food to enjoy it, you know, the turkey, even the Twinkies, you know, you know, with all the sugar, you know, God created the Twinkies so you can eat it, <laughs> as long as you don't eat it too much. too much. It's the same with wine. It's not nothing wrong to have a glass of wine, but as long as you don't get drunk, you know, because you, you don't give yourself to, a, to any addiction. So if God created all that. So we, we had a lot of fun eating a lot of food, you know, and, uh, and God gives you the opportunity to share your word. You know, even though you say, well, I'm, I'm doing all this studying, and all I see is people in the church, so I'm preaching to the choir here. So, but God will give you the opportunity. And that, so the training will continue. Right. Because God will give no matter where you are. And you should look for those opportunities. You know, just walk around the thing. I get a little discouraged because I'm home. I'm not out in the world anymore, you know. So who am I going to talk to? The opportunity will come. Yes. Yeah, so in, in, in my case comes this. Yeah. So I made a 
not a good impression, but I made this a uh, good thing. And uh, because I, I was like one of them, right. you know, and, uh, and they asked me to right. say it, uh, grace. They asked me to do this, to do that. So I, I responded, right. you know, and I, you always can. And they see by you, the way you behave and carry yourself, that it's, you know. Yeah. Good. And uh, so it was good. It was good. So I, I, I thank God for the opportunity. Yeah. That's what you used to do, you know? I go, when I go to North Carolina, when I'm surrounded by more people, you know. And uh, sometimes the, your reputation precedes you. Yeah. They say you're a religious cook. We need the heat. Uh, James, there's no heat. Yeah, obviously. Well, we are keeping warm ourselves, body heat. <laughs> Good thing I got my scarf. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go to verse 25. Um, Romeo? Okay, so Moses knew that the Hebrews was the people he belonged to, and that he eventually renounced his upbringing and uh, allied himself with his people, and the people were mistreated. So he chose to be mistreated for the sake of the Messiah than to enjoy the temporary pressures of sin, because sin can offer you only temporary pleasure. And they're very enticing, but uh, it can do that. So let's see what the text says. Moses had much to lose that was attractive, although the pressures are specifically attributed to sin. Faith and sinful pleasure do not belong together. The word for mistreated occurs only here in the New Testament and serves to link the sufferers closer together. There was solidarity between Moses and the people of God when he had once thrown his lot with them. Solidarity in suffering. In contrast, in contrast, the most that sin can provide is temporary pleasure. But the ill treatment meted out, meted out with the people of God has no such temporary character. Those who identify with God's people at once become the targets of God's enemies. Now, in other places in the world, if you become a Christian, you are persecuted. But thank God we live in a country where the most they can tell you is that, oh, you are a, you are a, you are a religious fanatic, which I take it as a compliment. Yes, I am a religious fanatic. What, what of it, you know? Uh, I wish everybody would be a religious fanatic, you know? And, uh, oh, and uh, so it, wa it was good. I mean, it was good. And, uh, and the, the thing is that we have an advantage over them because they do not read the Bible. They just heard it here and there. Oh, it's full of contradiction. But actually, they don't read it because if they would read it, they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. So we have, so we cannot, even though we have an advantage over them, we cannot be abusive. You know, you gotta, you gotta relax. You know, you gotta put that at the level. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, <coughs> Carmen, verse 26. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Okay, again, uh, sometimes when you choose to be with Christ, you take your life in your hands. In the, in the Middle Ages, uh, during the Reformation, of course, for example, Martin Luther, he was a leader of the Reformation, and he faced the Catholic authority that was in power for 1,500 years. And he alone faced that thing. And you know how powerful was the papacy at that time? All the kings of the world, we had to pay homage to them, to him. Everybody had to pay tax to, to the papacy. So the coffers of the Vatican really grew and grew and grew, okay? And everybody resented it, but uh, the Pope was the king of kings. He had such a dominance over things. And then when, when Martin Luther read in the Bible that the believer would be saved by faith, words to that effect, that liberated him. He said, well, I don't have to do all this penitence. I don't have to do this, all this... Uh, uh, things, external things. All he had to do is believe. And that, armed with the scriptures, he faced because that made irrelevant the Catholic Church. I don't need the Catholic Church. I don't need the priest. I don't need to go to confession. I don't need to pray to the saints. I don't need any of that. All I have to do is believe. That's the price of my salvation. And that, of course, if you do that, you make the Catholic Church irrelevant. It's all you need is to pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't need the trappings of religion. Yeah, but they didn't take it lightly. Of course not. That's what I'm saying. He faced the most powerful 
uh, government in the world at that time alone. And uh, the only reason that he got away with it because they put a price on his head is because the princess of, he was from Germany, the princess of Germany back him up. I said, well, we agree with Martin Luther, so we don't have to pay taxes to the Vatican. Mm -hmm. It was a big relief, right? right? So everybody started rebelling that, and that created a whole new thing. So the Catholics started with the counter-reformation, but it was never the same, OK? But uh, during that, this process, when the Catholic Church was powerful, all these people that chose to live by Christ, they put their lives in their hands. And uh, if you were translating the Bible into secular language, you would be killed. So many people suffer because they defy the authority. Okay, and so so the point that we have the pipe the Bible in our own language, it, it came at a high price for a lot of people. They even control kings. They do. Yeah. All the kings yeah. pay taxes to them. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's go to the next. Uh, no, we are here. Twenty six. So let's read what the text says. He regarded his grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the rest of Egypt. This is a strange and irrational superiority, which seems ludicrous in a materialistic age. A part of the greatness of Moses was that uh, he recognized that there were more valuable things in life than material treasures. But his grace that Moses endured is very similar to the Christian conditions that the readers of Hebrews were enduring or had endured. Moses gave up glory for the sake of the people of God. Christ gave up his glory for the sake of mankind and accepted scourging and shame and a terrible death. Moses in his day and generation shared in the sufferings of Christ, choosing the loyalty that led to suffering rather than the ease which led to earthly glory. He knew that the prices of earth were nothing compared with the ultimate reward of God. And then he said, because he was looking ahead to his reward, yes. These words mean that Moses focused his gaze on another target. The verb used means to look away, implying a deliberate turning from one thing to another. It has already been noted that the idea of reward, and particularly the word used here, which is recompense, is characteristic of this epistle. In the context of Moses' life, it must be interpreted of the spiritual treasures when he knew it would be his in view of the fact that he was not permitted to enter the promised land. The spiritual rewards, unlike material advantages, have an enduring quality which infinitely enhances their value. Yes, uh, you know that uh, the Bible tells you um, accumulate treasures in heaven, not in the, the earth. Because no matter how much you, uh, you accumulate here, when you die, it's gonna go to somebody else who does not appreciate the same way that you do. Sometimes I, I know this person, you know, well, in, also in your own case, when you have, let's say, a house and you pay your house for 30, de 30 years, the yes. mortgage, because you want to give an inheritance to your kids, you know, mm -hmm. so they don't have to pay. And maybe the kids will come and say, well, if I sell it, how much will I get it? And that's all they care, you know? They just care about the bottom line, you know? Mm -hmm. But but you you know what it means. Because when my parents uh, bought their houses, they left it for us. You know, um, and uh, I have a house in Peru. You know, and uh, and we don't want to sell it because it's 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 more than dollars and cents. It's a house where my daughter can go. My daughter can go, and uh, my relatives are there, Some and it's a piece of real estate that means more than just dollars and cents. Yeah. That's you know, history. it's a history, it's and uh, in the spirit of my parents, yeah. is to keep the house as an inheritance. Right. Now, somebody tells, why don't you just sell it and that? No, no, it's more than just uh, the first place my daughter doesn't need it and all that thing, you know? But it's more, it's the idea that my parents had to give to the kids, you know? It's a piece of real estate, which is good. But we appreciate it, and you want to uh, convey the same appreciation to your kids. Hopefully, they will react the same way. Um, okay, so we have now, Joe, can you read verse 27? He left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He preserved, preserved because persevered. No, it's persevered, right? Yeah. He saw him who is invisible. Okay, so when uh, when Moses was about 40 years old and he was in Egypt, he uh, saw two uh, Hebrews fighting, you know, and, uh, and then he 
he killed the no yeah, the Egyptian was treating bad a Hebrew, and then he killed the Egyptian. Okay. Then the following day he saw two Hebrews fighting and said, "What do you fight?" You know, and the Hebrew said, uh, "Who who are you? Who you're not nobody. You're not our boss. Are you gonna kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday?" So the word got out that he had killed the Egyptian. So a price was put on his head because even though he was the greatest general, he had enemies in the court, and they was just looking for opportunity like that. So uh, he left Egypt, and then he went to the land of Midian, okay, and they spent there 40 years. So he was high up, okay, and then he went to this other land and became a, a shepherd, well, you know, uh, living on the land, and and uh, he spent there 40 years. So what a difference between the prince and the, and the second life. And then after those 40 years, he was told to go back to Egypt and liberate their people. So what a, what a life. Okay. So he said, by faith he left Egypt. There came the day with Moses because of his intervention on behalf of his people, had to withdraw from Egypt to Midian. Moses did this and subsequently kept the Passover. You know what Passover means, right? Passover means that uh, when they were Egyptians were leaving Egypt, they kill uh, the blood, I mean the lamb, and with the blood they put on the doorpost and the lintels. So the angel, uh, when they would pass over, would not kill the first one, the, the first born, born in, the, in the house. So if you didn't have the blood there, all the firstborns of the house were killed. That was the Passover. Okay, so. So they took many steps leading to the Exodus and passed over because again, it is a powerful activity of faith which concerns the bridegroom. Faith is seen, is seen to override the king's anger, a remarkable achievement when it's remembered that the king had despotic powers. Since anger of that kind can be tyrannical, it takes a brave man to defy it, but faith can supply the courage to do so. He says not, not fearing the king's anger. Well, he says that uh, he wasn't afraid of the king, that's why he left. But in another portion of the Bible, he said that uh, he was afraid of the king, so he left. So let's, there's no contradiction here. He says here, not fearing the king's anger. Some people may find difficulty here because the Exodus narrative says that it was because Moses feared Pharaoh that he, he fled to Midian. Well, Hebrews says, the book of Hebrews, that he went out not fearing the wrath of the king. Well, there is no real contradiction. It's simply that the writer with a letter to the Hebrews saw even more deeply into the story. For Moses to withdraw to Midian was not an act of fear, but probably it was an act of courage. He showed the courage of the man who had learned to wait. The explanation may be also that Moses feared that God's purposes would be thwarted if he did not escape. But this is to be distinguished from personal fear. It's like a planned withdrawal. When you are fighting and you see that thing is not going well, you take your troops rear. That means you're not running, you're running away. You're not running, it's a, it's a planned withdrawal. It's a strategic withdrawal. So you can attack again. There was a Roman person whose name was Tacitus. He said, uh, who who fights and runs away may lead to fight another day. <laughs> but that uh, he in battle is slain, we never rise to fight again. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's intelligent, it's, it's shrewd, it's smart sometimes to retreat, to attack again. Okay, it's a, that's, that's what war, that's what Moses did. The Stoics were wise. They held that a man should not al throw his life away by needlessly provoking the wrath of the tyrant. At that moment, Moses might have gone but on, but his people were not ready. If he had gone on recklessly, he would have simply have thrown his life away and the deliverance from Egypt may never have happened. He was big enough and brave enough to wait until God said, now is the hour. If you remember when uh, when the, the, in World War II, when the Allies invaded Germany in 1944, uh, they wanted to invade in 1942, but they were not ready. So it took them two years to prepare, okay? And you have to be prepared, and the preparation took so much. And then the day of the invasion, they said, this is it, you know? <laughs> and they were not turning back. And uh, it was an amazing uh, story. Then he said he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. So him, which is God. The eye of faith can see what is invisible to the eyes of others. Moses, in all the wanderings in the wilderness, was conscious of God's presence in a remarkable way. The writer traces the secret of his endurance to a source beyond himself, which his opponents never even existed, knew 
his opponents never even knew existed. In Colossians 1.15, Paul speaks of God as invisible, although he recognizes that he has shown his image in Christ. There is no doubt it's a paradox in the seeing what cannot be seen. But this is of the very essence of faith. What is faith, you know? Like, uh, faith is believing what you cannot be seen. Remember Thomas? Thomas uh, was a disciple of Jesus. And then when Jesus appeared after his death, Thomas was not with the group. So when he was told that Jesus had resurrected, he said, I don't believe. You know, unless I put my finger in his, the holes of his hand and his side, I will not believe it. So the following time, Jesus appeared in front of Thomas. So he sees Thomas, yeah, Thomas, come here. Put your hand in here, put your hand. And then he said that, uh, my Lord, my God, and, that, and Jesus said, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are the ones who believe and have not seen. Like, that's us, you know? Okay, so let's continue with uh, verse 28. Who is next? Mm -hmm. Yes. Nico. No, you, just, you just read it. Oh, I just read, so that yeah, is that's you. me. Okay. Right. I will not take away that from you. I was skipping him. I was going that way. You got it. Okay. By faith, he kept the Passover and the, the abdication of blood, so that he destroyed, the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Okay. So, by faith, he kept the Passover. The Passover occupy a place of considerable significance for the Jewish mind and came to have an even greater meaning for Christians because it was so closely linked with the passion of Jesus. It was natural an event of historic importance when the original Passover was instituted. It centered in the face of Moses, according to this writer. So, there came the day when Moses had to make all the arrangements for the first Passover. The account is in Exodus 12. The unleavened bread had to be made. The Passover lamb had to be slain. The doorposts had to be smeared with the blood of the lamb so the angel of death would see the blood and pass over the house and not slay the firstborn in it. But the, the really amazing thing is that according to the Exodus story, Moses not only made this regulation for the night on which the children of Israel were living in Israel, he also laid it down that they were to be observed annually for all time. That is to say, he never doubted the success of the enterprise never doubted that the people would be delivered from Egypt and that someday they would reach the promised land. Here was a band of wretched Hebrew slaves about to set off on a journey across an unknown desert to an unknown promised land. And here was the whole power of Egypt hot upon their heels. Yet Moses never doubted that God would bring him safely through. He was really the man who had the faith that God gave him his people in order, he will also give him the strength to carry it out. Moses knew well that God does not summon his servants to a great task and leave it at that. He goes with them every step of the way. The next sentence says, the destroyer of the firstborn will not touch the firstborn of Israel. In the Hebrew text of Exodus 12, 23, it is the Lord who will execute judgment. But here there is simply a reference to the destroyer. The allusion is to the angel of death who passed over the houses where the sacrificial blood had been sprinkled on the doorposts and lintels, which ensure that the firstborn might be saved. Okay, so let's go to the verse 29. Nico? Okay, so... Here, here are the Hebrews running away, and they go, and they ride right in front of the Red Sea. In the meantime, the Pharaoh, who had let the Hebrews go, he changed his mind and said, no, we have, we're going to lose all this labor. Let's bring them back. If not, we're going to destroy them. So he's uh, chasing them. So the uh, Egyptians with the chariots and the horses were chasing the Israelites. And then the Israelites were in front, and there was the Red Sea. I mean, talking about between the rock and the hard place. There was no place to go. And they need all that faith you can get, okay? Now, some people, you know, of course, the people that revised the Bible, they said, oh, they were not really a, a, a big red sea. It was only about four, four of, you know, five feet, four or five feet, oh, four feet of water. That's all. That's all they were able to pass. But then he says that the Egyptians were drowned on it, <laughs> which is, 
if it's only four feet or three feet, they don't drown on it. Okay, so you always try to put a, a doubt in the people's mind, and that you always do that, you know. So, so it says here, by faith the people pass through the Red Sea as on dry land. The thought now moves away from the individual faith to a national faith, although the people's faith was still inspired by the faith of Moses. Clearly, the movement of the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt was a, a cooperative effort. At no time was faith needed more urgently that when the Israelites faced a formidable obstacle of the Red Sea, which buried their advance with the Egyptians' hat in the rear. And then he says, when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. There was a great act of the crossing of the Red Sea. The story is told in Exodus 14. There we read how the children of Israel were enabled to pass through and how the Egyptians were engulfed when they tried to do the same. It was at that moment that the faith of Moses communicated itself to the people and drove you know to the people and drove them on when they might have well turned back. Okay? Here we had the faith of a leader and of a people who were prepared to attempt the impossible at the command of God, realizing that the greatest barrier in the world is no barrier if God be there to help us overpass. So, in conclusion, you know, it was by faith that Moses left Egypt, and moved by the blazing anger of the king, where he could face all things as one who sees him who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses carried out the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroying angel might not touch the children of his people. It was by faith that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, as if they were going through dry land, and that the Egyptians, when they were ventured to do so, were engulfed, were drowned. To the Hebrews, Moses was the supreme figure in the history. He was the leader who had rescued them from slavery and who had received the law from God. To the writer of the letter of the Hebrews, Moses was mainly the man of faith. Finally, this passage not only tells us of the faith of Moses, he also tells us of the source of faith. Hebrews 11.27 tells us that he was able to face all things as one who sees him who is invisible. The outstanding characteristic of Moses was the close intimacy of his relationship with God. To put it simple, the secret of his faith was that Moses knew God personally. That's what he aimed to do. To every task that Moses did, he came out directly from God's presence. Moses had the faith he had because he knew God in the way he did. This is also for us. We, we have the faith because we know God in the way we do. When we come straight from God's presence, no task can ever defeat us. Our failure and our fear are so often due to the fact that we try to do things alone. The secret of victorious living is to face God before we face them. Amen. It's been said that uh, the faith in God is not a bridge over problems, but it's a tunnel to the problems, and he's with us. Amen. So I heard uh, a pastor say last week there are three things we had to keep in mind as we live our lives. One thing is uh, knowing God, the other one is loving God, and the, one, the other is serving God. Out of the three things, the most important is knowing God. Because by knowing God, reading the Bible, and praying all that, you get to love God. And by knowing God and loving God, automatically you're gonna serve God, okay? But if you jump and want to serve God without knowing God, you run into problems. That's why we have so many churches they rather feed the poor than read the Bible. Thinking by just feeding the poor, they're doing God's work. No, first you know God, then you do the work, okay? And that, as Harold the pastor that uh, also that when he was a boy, he, uh, he used to deliver newspapers. He didn't make the news, he didn't, he just delivered the news, okay? And uh, by, by, by giving the news, and that uh, he's still doing that because he's delivering the good news. I used to have a, a job also delivering newspapers by car. So I'm still doing that and delivering the news, okay? So, uh, and that's what we should, we all should do, deliver the good news, all right? We don't have to write it, we don't have to get, just deliver the good news. Okay, so let, let us finish with the, with the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here, dear Lord. Uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to study your word and now give us the strength here, Lord, to uh, share the word, share what we learn with people that do not know the gospel. 
the Lord bless the rest of this Sunday and bless the people that are coming to this church today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yes.